Well, this morning we have a very, very special guest um, speaker with us with John Away on the Man Up Retreat. His name is Dr. Tremper Longman. And some of you may know him. He is a RS professor up at Westmont. And some of you Westmont people might actually have him in class right now. I'm not sure. Um, but he's also just a very highly respected, well-known Bible scholar. He's an author. He's written many books, co-written some books on marriage. And the most recent book is called God Loves Sex. And very provocative, I know. I said sex in church. We're going to hear that a lot more this morning, so get used to it. Um, but that's his most recent book that he co-authored with Dan Allender. And so he's coming this morning to speak on that topic. Um, this is my last little plug for anyone that might have children in here. This might be a good Sunday to take them out to the kids' program, unless you want to have a really um, just jump-started conversation after, <laughs> after the service. So that's totally your call. <clears throat> but I just want to also say before I bring him up here that this topic has typically been so taboo in the church for some reason even though sex is something that, that comes from God and that he rejoices in. And um, so I just want to say, like, I know some of you may have some pain, some awkwardness, some woundedness, frustration, some just being downright uncomfortable talking about this this morning. Some of you may be in marriages where you're, this is joyful, this is an amazing part of your relationship, and that's awesome too, but I just, I want to... Um, Pray for us before we go into this, um, hearing this message. And actually, I want to call an audible. I'll pull a John Ireland this morning. Um, Heather actually brought this reading to our worship team this morning, and it really touched me and it made me think of this topic. So before I pray, I wanted to read this to you. When you recover from an illness, is it because you do anything? No. All you do is to lie on the bed and rest and the cleansing blood continuously flowing through your veins brings the healing. Open your heart in absolute trust while this purest and most precious blood in all history brings you complete cleansing and healing. Open your soul while the love of Christ, the acme of all spiritual love, the love which has the power to save and redeem the most hopeless of sinners, takes complete dominion over every area of your life. And I thought that was fitting if any of us are feeling broken in this area, that what we have to do is let Christ do the work and open our hearts to him this morning. So another John Irelandism, if you are here with your spouse this morning, maybe just reach a hand over. I want to pray for you guys. If you're not here with your spouse, I'm praying for them as well. If you're divorced, if you're single, this message is for all of us this morning. And so I just want to invite the Holy Spirit in. Would you pray with me? Father, we release our preconceived notions this morning, our baggage, our, the things that our culture has taught us about this topic, Lord, our past hurts, our brokenness. Lord, we recognize that you are the great healer, and even in this arena, you want to touch and to heal us, Lord. You want fullness and wholeness in our marriages even in our sexuality. So God, we ask that these words would fall fresh on our ears, that they would touch our hearts, or that they would be the beginning of conversations in our marriages uh, that would work toward healing and renewal and rightness, Lord, as you had planned it originally. And God, for those that are finding joy in this area, we praise you for that, and we thank you for that blessing. We thank you for the ways that you have planned sex, and I'm so excited to hear more about it this morning. So Lord, would you be with Tremper as he comes? Would you give him the words to say? And would you give us all open hearts to hear exactly what you want us to hear, whether we're single, whether we're married, whether we're divorced, whether our spouse is with us or not this morning? Would you just fill in all the gaps and um, touch our hearts? In Jesus' name, amen. Tremper Longman, everyone, would you give him a hand? It's a great pleasure to be here this morning with you, and uh, 
You know, I'll, usually when I preach, it's in a different town. I can speak, say whatever I want, leave town. <laughs> Indeed, uh, that would be particularly great on this topic because sexuality is such a fraught topic, as Casey was indicating. Indeed, it's the only time that I was disinvited from preaching. This was a few years ago, and when I taught at Westminster Theological Seminary for 18 years before I came to Westmont. And uh, one of my former students was pastoring a church in town, and he actually asked me to come, like John asked me to come, to talk about sexuality on Valentine's Day. <laughs> And uh, like some of my colleagues at Westminster Seminary of Reform School were well known for being Reformation Day preachers, and I was getting reputation as a Valentine's Day preacher. <laughs> I was comfortable with that. But, uh, but I get a call about a week ahead of time saying that the elders had met, heard I was going to preach on the Song of Songs, and disinvited me. The pastor felt badly. Now the the uh, logo or motto of this denomination is the whole counsel of God. So my reaction was, so much for the whole counsel of God. Uh, because you see, sexuality is A, such an important part of who we are, and the Song of Songs is such a major uh, statement about sexuality that uh, if you avoid the Song of Songs, you're not listening to the voice of God when it comes to sexuality. Now, this morning, I'm not going to be talking about a survey of sexuality. And, and uh, as Casey pointed out, we're all coming from different places in terms of sexuality. Some are single, some are divorced, widowed, uh, married, uh, struggling in marriage. This is not going to address everybody's issues. Uh, but what I am hoping for is that it will raise some categories to get you thinking. And also, we'll see that one of the main functions of the Song of Songs is to give us permission to talk to each other, both about our joys and our struggles in the area of sexuality. Now, the rabbis, the old rabbis living, you know, in the 2nd and 3rd century A.D., uh, said that no one under 30 years old should read the Song of Songs. I don't know what the rabbis were thinking, because I remember the first time I talked to my 12-year-old son, Trevor Longman IV, uh, about sex. I took him on a nice trip down to D.C., and we played squash, and uh, we went to movies, and we hung out, and then the moment came and I turned to him and I said, Tremper, I want to talk to you about sex. And he turned to me and he said, sure, Dad, what do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> now, the point is that either we're talking about sex within the context of families, using the Bible as our guide, or we're talking about it in the context of a church, which, as Casey pointed out, often treats the Song of Songs as a kind of taboo subject, or they're learning it among their uh, friends. And I just was teaching Young Life area directors in Colorado Springs about two weeks ago. It was an Old Testament survey class. They get seminary credit for it if they want it, and uh, I lectured on the Song of Songs to them, and interesting that the meal after that, we were sitting around talking, and they said that they were very concerned because a lot of their high school students, their committed Christian students, uh, particularly the girls, were getting pre-sale tickets for Fifty Shades of Grey. What? Now just think about that. I mean. Again, I'm, I haven't seen the movie. I know the basic premise, though. And do we want our children to learn about sexuality from things like Fifty Shades of Grey? Um, no, we want to talk about it together as families, as the church. Uh, fortunately, I got to talk about it earlier with my youngest son, Andrew, because when he was six. I was hard at work on the New Living Translation 
uh, project, and I was translating the Song of Songs up in my third floor office in Philadelphia, when I went down to get a little tea. And when I came back up, my six-year-old son Andrew and his friend Tommy were staring at my computer screen going, Dad, what are you doing? And I was translating the Song of Songs. They were shocked. So I simply responded, boys, I'm translating the Word of God. From that moment on, they were avid Bible readers. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's ask the question, what is the Song of Songs? And here, if I were teaching a course, I'd be spending a lot of time talking about this subject because, and, and one of my main purposes, and remember, I'm a teacher by day and an occasional preacher, so if this sounds a little bit like a lecture, that's because I'm a professor. But uh, I would spend a lot of time establishing what exactly the Song of Songs is, because you have to know what type of writing it is in order to read it correctly and to apply it to our lives. Now, many people through the years have thought it some kind of allegory, an allegory uh, which takes the man and the woman and their intimate conversation as reflecting primarily and only on our relationship with God. Christians uh, often interpret it as if the man is Jesus and the woman is the church or the individual Christian. Uh, there's nothing in the Song of Songs itself that would lead us to interpret the book that way. Uh, it is truly love poetry, describing a human man and a human woman and their intimacy. We're going to see that there are theological ramifications of this, but we have to first of all acknowledge that it's love poetry. But what kind of love poetry? And again, here we could spend 15, 20 minutes talking about it, but I'm just going to assert that what we have in the Song of Songs is an anthology of love poems. It's not telling a story. Sometimes you'll hear people say that it's telling the story about a couple, maybe Solomon and the Shulamite, um, and moves from their dating to their marriage or whatever. Uh, it's not telling a story. It's a collection of around 25 poems that a, celebrate God's good gift of sexuality, but also, B, warn us about the inherent dangers or difficulties, is a better word, of sexuality. So what I thought I'd do this morning is take a look at two poems. They're a little bit long, so we'll want to get right to them. Uh, and I will read them and interp interpret them for you and then make some comments about them. So we're going to turn first to a poem that celebrates sexuality. And this is the poem that we find in chapter 4, 1 through 5, 2. And here we'll see uh, a man is describing the beauty of the woman. And these are very erotic poems. And they describe the beauty of the woman beginning with her head and moving down her body to the object of his most immediate attention. We'll see what that is. I think you're already guessing. But, uh, but it's called a descriptive poem. And uh, we have uh, a number of examples of these in the Song of Songs and elsewhere. So it begins, you are beautiful, my darling, beautiful beyond words. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. Uh, now, let me pause here as we proceed. We're going to be seeing that he uses a lot of metaphors and similes to describe the woman's beauty. Sometimes at our cultural distance, they're hard to penetrate and know exactly what they're getting at. In what way are her eyes like doves? Does it mean they're fluttering? Is it a uh, reference to uh, peace or the calmness that comes from looking at her? Uh, it's probably a reference to her pupils because we'll see in the next poem that the woman will describe his 
uh, eyes like doves bathed in milk, so surrounded by white. So if you just get the flow of it, some of them will be able to penetrate a little bit more precisely. Goes on and says, your hair falls in waves like a flock of goats winding down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are as white as sheep, recently shorn and freshly washed. Your, uh, your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is inviting. Uh, and I'll pause here just for a second uh, to point out that this is not a really wise compliment to use these days. Basically saying, honey, you're beautiful and you have all your teeth doesn't work like it did in antiquity. But in a day of bad dental care and uh, coarse grains, this was quite a compliment. Again, your lips are like scarlet ribbon, your mouth is inviting. Your cheeks are like rosy pomegranates behind your veil. Another thing to notice as we read through this poem is how sensual it is, in the sense of appealing to every sense. Love in the Song of Songs puts an emphasis on the physicality of it, the physical intimacy of it. Love is rarely talked about as an emotion. Of course, the emotion lies behind it, and this feeling of desire for physical intimacy flows from it. But there's appeals here, you'll notice as we read through it, to touch, hearing, taste, uh, and uh, sight, and all the, all the senses. Your neck is as beautiful as the Tower of David, jeweled with the shields of a thousand heroes. It's not that she has a long, slender neck, but it's a majestic neck. And uh, it's, it's ornamented with a necklace, just like in an ancient military tower, the soldiers would hang up their ornamental shields on the outside. Your breasts are like two fawns, twin fawns of a gazelle, grazing among the lilies. Now let me help you with this one. <laughs> because this one's a little difficult unless you get the perspective correctly. Uh, most people, because the text talks about the heads, are thinking they're looking at the head, uh, looking at the fawns head on. But actually their heads are down while their rounded rears and their nipple-like tails are up in the air. So. He's exulting in her beautiful breasts. Before the dawn breezes blow and the night shadows flee, I will hurry to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. You are altogether beautiful, my darling, beautiful in every way. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon. Come down from Mount Amana, from the peaks of Samir and Hermon, where the lions have their dens and leopards live among the hills. Now, here, of course, we need to remember it's a poem. She's not literally in some leopard cave up in a mountain in Lebanon. The poem is emphasizing distance and danger as long as you're away from me. So it's an appeal to her to seek intimacy in his arms. You've captured my heart, my treasure, my bride. You hold it hostage with one glance of your eyes, with a single jewel of your necklace. Your love delights me, my treasure, my bride. Your love is better than wine, your perfume more fragrant than spices. Your lips are as sweet as nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. Your clothes are scented like the cedars of Lebanon. You are my private garden, my treasure, my bride, a secluded spring, a hidden fountain. So now we come to the climax of the poem, where he's going to describe her garden. And it's a garden like none other, filled with the most exotic spices. And there's a spring in the garden, a fountain in the garden. And this is a well-known ancient Near Eastern metaphor for the woman's most private place. He goes on and says, Your thighs shelter a paradise of pomegranates with rare spices, henna with nard, nard and saffron, fragrant calamus and cinnamon, with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, and every other lovely spice. You are a garden fountain, a well of fresh water streaming down from Lebanon's mountains. Now, the man has described her garden as a locked garden, a garden that has not yet been entered. 
And then the woman responds to the man by saying, Awake, north wind, rise up, south wind, blow on my garden and spread its fragrance all around. Come into your garden, my love. Taste its finest fruits. Which is a poetic way of saying, yes. <laughs> the young man then says, I've, had, I've entered my garden, my treasure, my bride. I gather my myrrh with my spices and eat honeycomb with my honey. I drink wine with my milk. And that's a poetic way of saying, yippee. <laughs> now the young women of Jerusalem come in at the end and say, Oh, lover, beloved, eat and drink. Yes, drink deeply of your love. And, uh, and here are these young women, the chorus functions as, as a group of disciples of the woman in matters of love. Uh, they're single and looking on, not in some kind of voyeuristic way, but in a way that here gives society's approbation to what they're doing. You've often heard it said, what happens in the bedroom you know, it's my own business. Well, sexuality is actually something that is deeply affecting of societies and communities. And, uh, and, and, and that's, that's uh, acknowledged in this way by the Song of Songs. Now, there are appropriate ways for the community to get involved, and there are inappropriate ways for the community get, to get involved. But sexuality is not just a private matter. So what do we learn from a poem like this one? One that celebrates sexuality. Well, again, it first of all shows us that, as the title of the new book says, God loves sex. God created human beings uh, as sexual beings. And we'll come back to see how the Song of Songs actually fits in to a biblical theology of sexuality that begins in the Garden of Eden. Secondly, this poem, as I alluded to earlier, gives us permission and encouragement to talk openly about sexuality, particularly within our families, but also within the church. A lot of problems arise when we stifle conversation, particularly between husbands and wives, about sexuality. So that's the second thing that we learn here. Um, so, um, yeah, so we learn, too, from this poem and the others like it, we find what one author called a language of erotic love here. Um, so, it also gives us encouragement within marriage to enjoy sexuality and to play in the area of sexuality. So there's, there's much to learn from a poem like this, but we have to quickly go on and acknowledge the second major theme of the Song of Songs, which is a recognition of our brokenness in the area of sexuality. Again, in a moment, I'll be talking about how the Garden of Eden story in Genesis 2 moves to the alienation in the area of sexuality in Genesis 3. But the Song of Songs recognizes this. It recognizes just how hard it is for human beings living in a fallen world to enjoy God's good gift of sexuality. So let's read through uh, the second poem, starting with 5-2. The woman is speaking here. I slept, but my heart was awake when I heard my lover knocking and calling, open to me, my treasure, my darling, my dove, my perfect one. My head is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of the night. So um, here, the man is standing at the door, asking her to open her door to him to allow him to enter. This is a well-known ancient Near Eastern motif for sexual intercourse. She responds, though, by saying, I've taken off my robe. Should I get dressed again? I've washed my feet. Should I get them soiled? Now, that's a poetic way of saying, I have a headache. So, <laughs> in other words, he's moving toward her 
but she's moving away from him. But then it goes on, my lover tried to unlatch the door and my heart thrilled within me. Actually, uh, I was voted down on this one in order to give the more authentic meaning of my innards, my erogenous zones heated up within me. She's becoming aroused now. So I jumped up to open the door for my love and my hands dripped with perfume, my fingers dripped with lovely myrrh as I pulled back the bolt. I opened to my lover, but he was gone. My heart sank. So see, here you have the man moving toward the woman for intimacy, but the woman moving back, then the woman's moving to the man for intimacy, but he's now gone. Now, this well describes the fact that often, as couples, we have difficulty finding the right moment, shall we say. And there's sometimes when, when men are interested and women aren't, or women are interested and men aren't, and, and sexuality becomes a struggle. And, uh, but here, and sometimes in our, in our culture, when sexuality becomes a persistent struggle, when our needs are not being met, uh, too often we move to the isolation category. You're not meeting my needs, so I'm going to withdraw from you. And sometimes that even issues forth into divorce. Now, there are good reasons to get divorced, biblical reasons, but in our day and age, as I've observed in my own uh, nuclear family, uh, too often, people are quick to opt for that. Now, here we'll see that the woman is unwilling to leave it there. But now she's going to pursue intimacy even in spite of some tremendous obstacles. As we read on, it goes, I searched for him but could not find him anywhere. I called to him, but there was no reply. The night watchmen found me as they made their rounds. They beat me and bruised me. <laughs> and stripped off my veil, those watchmen on the walls. Now, the watchmen on the walls represent those social forces which are trying to keep the man and the woman from each other. And again, we have to remember it's a poem, and the point that's being made is that she is moving even through very difficult obstacles in order to fight for her relationship with the man. And she enlists those women of Jerusalem by saying, make this promise to a woman of Jerusalem, if you find my lover, tell him I'm weak with love. And then the women respond, why is your love better than other lovers? O oh, woman of rare beauty, what makes your lover so special that we must promise this? Now this is a way of setting up poetically her very sensuous description of the man. My lover is dark and dazzling, better than 10,000 others. His head is finest gold, his wavy hair is black as a raven, his eyes sparkle like doves beside springs of water. They are set like jewels washed in milk, his cheeks are like gardens of spices giving off fragrance. His lips are like lilies perfumed with myrrh, his arms are like rounded bars of gold set with beryl. His body is like bright ivory glowing with lapis lazuli. That's the PG-13 translation. Uh, just imagine what ivory looks like in its natural state. And that's the part of the body that's being described here. His legs are like marble pillars set in sockets of finest gold. His posture is stately like the marble cedars of Lebanon. His mouth is sweetness itself. He's desirable in every way. Such a woman of Jerusalem is my lover, my friend. And now, now the women of Jerusalem are interested in helping her. Where has your lover gone, O woman of rare beauty? Which way did he turn so we can help you find him? My lover has gone down to his garden, to his spice beds, to browse in the gardens and gather the lilies. I am my lover's and my lover is mine. He browses among the lilies. Now, sometimes the garden is the place of intimacy. So she's anticipating as she fights her way through uh, that they will, once again, uh, be intimate with one another. Okay, so um, what do these poems that talk about difficulty of, of intimacy, what are they telling us? Well, first of all, I think they're reminding us that we need to go into marriage and we need to maintain our marriages with the correct types of expectations. 
I don't think it's as much the case as it was when I got married 40 some years ago that people would go into marriage thinking that if you got married all your sexual problems would be uh, would be uh, resolved because now you're married you can have sex and I remember listening to a really good talk before I got married where the person said, yes, you are marrying somebody created in the image of God and it's glorious and wonderful and you should treat your, your uh, spouse that way. But remember too that you are sinners, self-seeking sinners bent in on ourselves, uh, seeking our own, our own needs and desires. And so, if you have struggles in this area, uh, don't be surprised. So, uh, I think just in the area of expectation, we learn a lot from this poem. And indeed, the teaching of the Bible on sexuality is very realistic. Uh, and it starts its realistic teaching way back in Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, God created Adam and Eve, and they were naked, and they felt no shame. In other words, they were not only physically open and vulnerable to each other, but they were emotionally, spiritually, uh, psychologically whole and open with each other. But then we turn the page to Genesis 3, and because of rebellion, against uh, God, which fractured our relationship with God. It had a concomitant fracturing of the relationship within human relationships, symbolized by Adam and Eve now covering themselves up and hiding from each other. God graciously, in a token of grace, gives them clothing, uh, but now the man and the woman can no longer be naked and feel no shame. Now, if you read the Song of Songs in the light of Genesis 2 and 3, as you read through it, you see, as we see anticipated in that second poem, the man and the woman are back in the garden, naked, enjoying each other most of the time. In other words, the Song of Songs is part of the story of the already not yet redemption of sexuality. And so um, it's good that the Bible gives us this way of understanding ourselves, both in terms of the joys and the struggles that we have in the area of sexuality. Now the other thing, the final thing that I'll point out about the Song of Songs is that, in a sense, those early church fathers who allegorized the Song of Songs as a poem which speaks of the relationship of God and the church weren't totally wrong. They weren't totally wrong. They were wrong to bypass the human dimension of the song, but they were right to see that the Song of Songs does speak to our relationship with Jesus Christ. After all, throughout the Bible, uh, not explicitly within the Song of Songs, but throughout the Bible, um, our relationship with God is likened to many different things. You know, He is our King, He's our Shepherd, He's our Father. But starting in the earliest parts of the Old Testament, all the way through the book of Revelation, the Bible describes our relationship with God as our lover, as our husband. Uh, just think of Ephesians 5 and that controversial passage that talks about uh, the woman submitting to the man in the context of mutual submission in Ephesians 5.21 and the man loving his wife, uh, Paul says that our marriages are mirrors of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And what does that teach us? Well, again, the Song of Songs teaches us that a 
that marriage intends to be a relationship where there is mutuality. And notice how in the Song of Songs, the not only the man, but also the woman pursues relationship. I think that the Song of Songs debunks the modern 21st century evangelical Protestant idea that the woman waits at home for the man to make initiatives. No, actually in the Song of Songs, the woman is the pursuer and initiator as often, or even more often, than the man. So there's a mutuality that's taught about marriage that also reminds us about the mutuality that we have in our relationship with God. There's also an exclusivity of relationship. Marriage is the only human relationship where there can be only one other. You can only have one spouse. Um, and in the same way, we can only have one God, which is why, you know, the Old Testament will often talk about God's jealousy as his people go off after other gods. And also, the marriage metaphor and the Song of Songs, first of all, the Song of Songs teaches us about the need to cultivate intimacy within our marriages, and that intimacy reflects the type of intimacy that we should have in our relationship with God. And it's very appropriate to reflect on how marriage and physical intimacy uh, teach us about our relationship with God uh, at the end of the sermon, just before we celebrate together the Lord's Supper. Um, and, uh, and I want to read to you, in closing, a short quote from a very good writer named Mike Mason in a book called The Mystery of Marriage. And he says this, he says, uh, that sexuality is to experience a feeling that behaves in many ways like fear, except that it is indescribably delicious. Of all the sensations we can experience with our physical senses, Surely, this is the one that comes closest to the Lord's Supper in being an actual touching of the source of our being, of our Creator. And so, uh, let me close by calling Dave Wolf up here, who's going to lead us in uh, the Lord's Supper. And as we do, just reflect on the intimacy, the passion, the exclusivity that marriage teaches us about our relationship with God. Thank you, Trent.